Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Levan Talitvoy. I, I go by Levi, and uh, my colleague here, friend and colleague, is Kirk Hawkins over here. Hi. And we are here to talk about our book, uh, The Com Contemporary U.S. Populism in, com in a Comparative Perspective, uh, which is by Cambridge University Press. It's uh, from this element series of, of relatively short books. So, uh, so take a look at the series. It, it, it's got some great summaries of very interesting uh, titles. Uh, Kirk, why did we why did we write this book? Well, uh, partly because we were invited. Uh, folks at Cambridge uh, realized they they wanted a, a a title in on populism, and they could pursue it from an Americanist angle. The editor of the American series uh, within the Element series, uh, Francis Lee. I uh, was really keenly interested in bringing a comparativist perspective to to the Americanists who were starting to study populism. But it's kind of like, you know, as, as I think you and I saw it, they were sort of like 15 years behind where the Latin Americanists and the Europeanists were, where we had already understood the idea that, look, populism is a separate thing. You're going to have to measure the ideas separately for the politicians and for the voters. And you can't just equate that with people's issue positions. But the Americanists, that's what they were doing, right? They were studying it, starting to, but it was all just about issue positions. The, the ideas themselves really weren't getting a lot of attention. And we thought, hey, we can show them how to do this. And so I think that's that's kind of how the book came into being. Yeah. So one of the things I was uh, I was amazed is when you when you approached me. Um, I'm I'm Hungarian. I'm from Hungary, but I actually am more of an Americanist than than, than you are. You're more of a Latin America scholar, at least has been uh, until this book. And uh, and one of the things that amazed me is just the the, the pile of data you you have amassed on the United States uh, going back to 2008 that never really got a, uh, a fair shake of 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 being recognized and and seen and I was very excited to to uh, to take a look at it from the perspective of I mean we've been doing research together on uh, comparative research together for for a while now. That's and right. uh, and it was very interesting to see all this American data just show up and uh, and uh, can you can you tell us what you collected, why you collected, when you collected? Yeah, well, you know, a part of this is just uh, you know if you're here working in the U.S., it's just kind of easy to collect that data. Sometimes it's by way of piloting things. So when we started trying out ways of measuring populist attitudes and surveys, well, where did I pilot that? You know, right here at home, working with some of my Americanist colleagues, uh, it was just a natural place to go. And so that happened. And once you start that, you know, you collect a little more and before you know it, you've got a couple rounds of these things. Uh, the speech data was a little more deliberate. So we had started, uh, we, we had this idea of wanting to look at Trump and the other candidates in the 2016 campaign. We'd already done this elsewhere, and the way things were shaping up with Trump and really a couple of other possible populists in this campaign, it was so extraordinary. I just thought, look, we've got to do this. And so um, so that that wasn't an accident. That one was was pretty deliberate. And, and then we did a long series, right, of his campaign speeches and also the other candidates. Yes, but uh, I mean, going back to, if I remember, yeah, 2008, you had survey data on populism long, long before most people have thought about populism as as an attitude. I mean that that actually came later. Very few people know that uh, that you were one of the one of the people who la launched that idea of of let's try to measure uh, populism as an attitude. And you started doing it back in two thousand eight uh, in the United States. So so okay. So let's let's ask the question that everybody wants to know is uh, so how how populist is Donald Trump? Well, I, Levi, you may have a graphic there to, to show that, but uh, yeah. what, what we did, though, was we took our speech uh, analysis techniques, and we'd already done this for lots of other world leaders and said, you know, we can do this for Trump, too. And so we did a sample of four speeches where we analyzed him, and we're able to use that then to, you know, make, do this really direct comparison of Trump versus other chief executives around the globe. I'll tell you, the graphic has Trump pretty much placed in the middle. So his average level of populism during uh, the first year or two uh, of him in office. And we, we did update that. For the book, they, the, one of the few requests they made of us was, you know, this is nice. You've got some data on Trump. 
but it's just for his first year. We've had another year in office now. Can you update that? So this is a pretty good number we've got on him. And really, he's just kind of there in the middle. And um, yeah, so he's comparing with other leaders like, uh, say, Viktor Orban in Hungary and uh, Recep Erdogan in, in Turkey. And and so on the one hand, that's to say, well, there is some populism there. He's comparing with other leaders that we, we know are also populist. They're talked about in those terms. And we think their populism even has some serious consequences. But he's not nearly as populist as, say, uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela that, that really stands out for someone with you know, just a much stronger populist rhetoric. So he's just right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how do we measure this? How, how, how do we know? Yeah. So uh, I started to get into this a little and, and said that we, you know, we do this by looking at speeches. We have a way of doing a textual analysis. A typical textual analysis in political science, what, you know, what we call a content analysis, would try to look for an idea at the level of words or sentences, maybe at the extreme paragraphs. But what we've done here is say, populism is a different kind of idea. It's much more uh, latent and diffuse in a text. And if you try to look at it at the level of words or sentences, you actually can't see it all because it's an aggregate of a, of a series of ideas, really. But when you look across a whole text, you can see it pretty quickly. And so early on, this was work we did back in the mid 2000s, uh, before we had done any work on public opinion, uh, we figured out that we can have uh, coders who speak the native language uh, read speeches and after a bit of training where they've seen some really strongly populist speeches and some in between not so populist then some that aren't populist at all it's pretty easy for them to identify its features and more, just as importantly to be able to scale this in a way that's consistent across speeches and languages and in this case obviously it's simpler because the coders were just doing this in English our training is always in English and then the coders will go off and and read these speeches in their native languages. Well, the native language was the same language of the training uh, here. Um, what we have them do is look at a sample of four speeches for each term of the chief executive. There's gonna be a campaign speech, typically the beginning or ending speech of the campaign, um, an international speech, a ribbon cutting speech, and a famous speech. And that, that's intentional, that mixes some speeches where we think we're likely to see populism if there was any, like a famous speech or especially a campaign speech. But then also some where populism is less likely to show up. And if it really does show up, then we can have confidence this leader really was pretty consistently populist. And that's the case for the international ribbon cutting where populism is on average a lot less common. Uh, coding up any one of those speeches can take about an hour, reading through it, writing up a rubric. Uh, there's not a lot of, you know, we don't have to split things up into the tiny words and phrases, and that saves a lot of time for these coders. And the result then is just a single score, but, but it's pretty quick. And again, we have data that's comparable across countries, which is really nice. Yeah. Now, obviously, this, uh, this sampling of speeches did not work for the, the campaign. So, um, so how, how did you how did you end up doing that? Yeah, and so the book features uh, separately uh, because it is a different sample. We look at the series of speeches for the U.S. campaign at Trump and at Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, and then of course at that time we had a few Republican contenders in the primary. We're ca we capture uh, some of the more significant ones. Uh, for that one, to do that sample, and, and again, the reason we don't just throw this in the mix with the chief executives is because the sample is different, and they're not really completely comparable. Per speech, yeah, but once we average those, no, not anymore. And, and so this was, you know, we kind of had to invent this as we went along. We hadn't done a time series like this for a candidate. And so what we ended up doing was saying, you know, let's hit about two speeches a month. We will try to get more significant speeches because the candidates will do a lot of, you know, quick uh, kind of stump speeches uh, at, at places where they stop along the way. Those are short, not as helpful. Um, and so these would be things that would be captured, uh, you know, nationally. Uh, there was a transcript that was easy for us to find. And also, uh, importantly, later on for some of our other analyses, YouTube videos that we could use to check some features of the speech outside of the text. But again, about two per month for Trump and Clinton. And for the others, honestly, about as many as we could. The one that we did do consistently for all of them was their announcement speech. And then we also uh, did a couple of dates, like, you know, Super Tuesday is one where they all are gonna speak that day. And so we captured that as well. Yeah. 
So let's recap. It's been a while. Who are who are the candidates and who ended up being uh, populist? So hmm. so this is 2016. So Donald Trump is running against uh, uh, a large stage full of Republicans, and uh, and the people who who the candidates that that came out ahead was uh, Ted Cruz, yeah, yeah. Was the senator from Texas. And uh, Donald Trump, and th of course there were many others, but uh, but what did the results say about them? Yeah, so Cruz was uh, about as populist as Trump. Again, kind of the middle of the scale. Um, and um, among the other Republicans, I'm trying to think of all the ones we looked at. There were a few, although for each one of these, right, you can only just do a few speeches because the primary. Uh, campaign really is a little shorter than we, than we sometimes think, and there aren't that many opportunities to capture their speeches then. We get more as we continue to look on in the rest of the, the general election campaign. Um, but yeah, Cruz uh, stood out there with Trump, but otherwise among the Republicans, there wasn't anybody who was kind of in the, the highly populist uh, range, just in the middle. There were a few, of course, like John Kasich that are you know way low, they just don't have any populism at all. Uh, then the other interesting finding for us was among Democrats. Uh, we weren't surprised to find that Hillary Clinton had a very low score, essentially not populist. But um, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, turned up to be very populist and quite a bit more than Trump or Cruz. And that was, uh, again, not completely surprising. We had a sense of the, the kind of the radical quality of his issue positions. Um, Sanders isn't someone who we think of as being particularly you know, wild or radical and, and, you know, angry or bellicose. And that is a feature of populist language. But as we looked at it, in fact, he's, he's pretty hard on that 1%, um, that economic elite and those who are with them. And he, he, he doesn't pull his punches on them. And, and so looking at it closely, and this is part of the fun of this, is to really look at, their, at what they say and not kind of what we say about what they say and what gets repeated in, in the press and just in our conversations with friends. But Really looking at their language, yeah, I mean, Bernie was, he stood out there. He was about as populist as Hugo Chavez. Well, let me, let me, let me ask you this. Like, uh, you say that looking at the language is, is, is useful, but some would say that, uh, that, uh, that some populists are very legitimately uh, speaking in these terms and they believe what they say and others are just pandering. They're just politicians and they say what they think will get them elected. Uh, what do you say to that crit critique? Well, I, you know, there are a lot of answers to that, uh, depending on kind of what our purpose is, whether it's, you know, we just want to measure if they're populist or whether we want to understand, you know, why people are voting that way. So, for example, if you think about why people are voting for them, then their sincerity may not matter that much. Uh, you know, the, the question is, what do the voters see and if, or hear? And if what they're hearing and seeing is a lot of populism, then they say, well, okay, I wanted a populist, I'm going to vote for him. Um, and we have to imagine as we looked at other world leaders, I mean, if there's a lot of inconsistency there, if it turns out they really weren't sincere and after the election, it just goes away. You know, we see at least a few cases of populists like that who lose uh, their public support pretty quickly. And there's a kind of disillusionment once people realize, oh, you know, they didn't mean that. Um, so, so in that sense, the language still matters, but, um, yeah, I think you're also getting at a second question here, which is when we're looking at populism, I mean, is this also in some way just measuring whether these leaders are just like paranoid or irrational? Are they crazy uh, when they say these things? And honestly, we've usually steered clear of that. That's very hard to, you know, to measure in any objective way. Uh, the best we've been able to do, at least with Trump, this was possible, uh, as well as the other candidates like Hillary, was at least to see their consistency. And, you know, we can talk again in a moment about what we learn as we have a chance to observe the consistency and look more closely at the elements of the populism or not in their speaking. With Trump, we learned uh, some very interesting things that I think were revealing about, you know, where these ideas came from, how sincerely they were held. Honestly, though, we don't normally have that chance. Most leaders, we, we get a, a couple of snapshots of them and and then, you know, whether that's sincere or not, whether it shows a kind of disconnect from reality or not, is really very hard to do, very hard to say. Yeah. So let, let's go back to the speeches. So, so what are the key components that are coded up in the, in the speeches? Or well, the again, this is populism? a, yeah, so this is a really holistic approach. And we don't um, even, uh, we did make an exception with 
the with this candidate series in the U.S., we actually had for the first time ever we had the coders look at separate components and score them separately, and we just wanted to try that out because normally we don't. They just give a score for the whole thing, where they do record a, or, or allow uh, you know at least some record of their impressions about the components of populism to come through. Is in our rubrics we we do ask them to give illustrative quotes, and we categorize those quotes according to you know which component of populism that fits under. And so as I, I don't think we ever I don't think we ever said what are the components. What the components are. <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. So yeah. but those components are, and the central ones really, I mean, we can talk about other features of populism, but the core is, do you talk about the will of the common people and you talk about an evil conspiring elite? And if you've got those two things together, then that's, that's populism uh, when you've got that. And in fact, that's usually how we define it, right? We say it's a it's a way of framing political uh, competition as a struggle between the will of the common people and a conspiring elite. So if you're to look for components, those would be it. Those would be the two main ones. A very re closely related component though, is we sometimes analyze, we call it, you know, if they have a Manichaean worldview or cosmology. Uh, it's really similar to, you know, people versus elite, because as soon as you say people versus elite, you're also doing something very uh, dualistic or Manichaean. You're saying, I think that there's a knowing evil out there that confronts the good and so the contest is between these two sides that each have a kind of agency to them and that's contrasted in in say the case of pluralism we speak where the evils that are out there are more impersonal they're not like an agent that's confronting us it's just a thing that's happening that we're all trying to deal with so um now those are that's kind of the core of populism if you don't have that you're going to score low you should be a zero or somewhere close to it but but um there are some ancillary elements, uh, things that kind of heighten the, this, this, the, the tone, the angry bellicose tone of the speech. Uh, you know, how much do they talk about the need for institutional change or revolution or liberation is one. Another is the kind of anything goes attitude they take towards their opponents, towards the decorum that we're supposed to show our competition in electoral politics that we should show towards norms of reasoning and debate. And for populists, those a lot of times just get tossed out the window in their efforts to uh, save the people from this very evil elite. So uh, again, a core, some ancillary elements, and those do get captured a little bit in the coding rubrics. You can see where the quotes are and what seems to come through. And the coders also reflect in their own words, you know, what were they seeing in this speech? What made it populist and what made it more or less populist? So, um, yeah, no, I think that answered your question about kind of how we code. But did you want to go yeah. first? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, where I wanted to go is what you already foreshadowed with uh, with Donald Trump, that we had a little bit more information on these speeches than, uh, than, than before, not just the holistic score. And uh, that might be a little bit suggestive of why maybe Trump is not that much of a populist, at least based on these speech codings. Uh, you want to you wanna get into that a little bit? Yeah, I can elaborate. So when we see a, a medium score of populism for a leader, it could be a couple of things, right? It could be maybe they had a couple of really strong populist speeches and then the rest weren't. Maybe they're just kind of mildly populist everywhere. Trump was sort of a third situation where we realized that, uh, now, first of all, we, we did have a sense that some speeches were just not populist. So there was some of that. Like he has some zeros in his mix. And then he asked some others, but he never really goes really high on the others. And we thought, well, that's kind of funny. What's going on? What holds him back? And the coders indicated really early on that what they saw was that um, in a lot of speeches, he would, he would still be really anti-establishment, anti-elite. That came, that came through consistently across almost all of them. But what didn't come through consistently was referring to the will of the common people. He just, he, there were a lot of times he just did not talk about that. Instead, he would talk about himself. Uh, there was this real kind of narcissism that would come through. And, you know, me and my team are the ones who are going to save this, this country and help all of you. And, uh, and we thought, well, that is really interesting. And, uh, and the thing, and then Levi, this is something that you and I both worked on together, was to take that rough insight and to say, well, you know, can we... Can we actually look at this a little more carefully, a little more systematically? And what we hit on, right, was this idea of, well, why don't we look at the speeches that have teleprompters, because those are the prepared speeches, and then the speeches that aren't. And one of the reasons we hit on that was that we noticed that his debate performance in particular was really low in populism. And the debates are really not scripted very much, especially for Trump. He's, he's really extemporaneous, off the cuff. 
And so that means that when he speaks in his own voice, the populism is going away. And maybe then when it's the prepared speech, it's coming in. And we looked and yeah, sure enough, the teleprompter speeches were the ones where the populism came through clearly. And the, the, the ones that it was just him speaking from, from the, off the cuff, um, that's the one where the populism didn't come through. So Trump, in other words, I think he himself is sincerely anti-establishment and that's still a cause for concern. But, uh, but in his own mind, I think he mostly sees himself uh, leading things. He celebrates himself as the will that should be, uh, and, and the will of the people, well, it's out there. And, and, he, and when he's coached, he knows he should praise the people, but I don't know how sincerely he feels that. Yeah, uh, we actually had a collaboration with The Guardian. Uh, we, they, they came and met us at, uh, at one of our meetings and, uh, and we discussed if we could do a series on populism, which ended up uh, being an 84 piece series on populism called uh, The New Populism Project in The Guardian. And uh, I mean, we were not involved with, with all 84, but we were involved with several pieces there. And one of them was on this. They, 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 they grabbed onto the speeches and compared the uh, speeches of Trump with, uh, on and off a teleprompter. So if you're interested in this, uh, I'd say uh, Google that Guardian teleprompter Trump and, uh, and it'll come up. And uh, this is based on one of the findings of the book. Uh, except done actually quite beautifully um, from a from a data journalism point of view, I would say. So I was pretty yeah. happy about that series. So. Me too. A lot of great data visualization. And I still love sharing those with my students, uh, maybe more even than some of my own uh, regular academic work. It's, it's very accessible, very vivid. And yeah. particularly in this case of Trump, I thought their coverage of this this, uh, this uh, the, the kind of Trump, the, the teleprompter test, as they put it, was, uh, was really well done.